even the human environment, within the human environment, animals appear to be colonized by lysogens in high proportions, and nobody understands why. So there's more lysogens associated with animals than there is in any other environment. So it appears that being a lysogen contributes some kind of benefits to the bacteria when it comes to colonizing animals. Right? Um, and here's a, one example, okay, the lysogen impacts bacterial fitness is the case of Shavonella that we isolated from Sayona. It has two prophages in the genome, and we did knockouts of these prophages in collaboration with Jeffrey Browning. Um, so this one is a wild type. This is a knockout for SF mu. This is a knockout for SF pat, and then we did a double knockout. Okay. And basically in, in this show and other, being a lysogen negatively impacts its ability to, to form biofilms. Because the wild type forms less biofilms than any of the knockouts. Include, these are the single knockouts and the double knockouts. And the single knockouts and the double knockouts of all the different variants make more biofilms than the one carrying the prophages. And that is an interesting phenomenon for a microbe that likes to colonize animals. Okay? Because to colonize an animal, it needs to be able to <coughs> sow and make a viral film. And in this case, the prophage appears to be impacting its ability to make a viral film. So this is interesting because we know that prophages tend to integrate into specific sites of the genome, but some of the prophages integrate randomly. And we're very interested in this, and we've sequenced now 11 bacterial genomes to understand where the prophages are. Because we think that the prophages, when they integrate, could be impacting metabolic pathways, including biosynthetic pathways that control biofilm formation. And here, basically, that same data showing that the double knockout of the, of the um, right, the 6-3, the blue line is the double knockout, makes way more biofilms than any of the other variants that are these prophages. But one of the things we want to know, of course, is do these immune proteins matter? Another feature that we discovered recently is that these proteins, this is, this is why studying these microbes, these cultural illness is so important. These bacteria that colonize the gut of animals appear to be undergoing phase variation. Phase variation is a common thing that bacteria often do when they're stressed, also known as morphotype switching, and it's often driven by epigenetics or genome inversions. And that phase variance can alter the behavior of the bacteria and often stimulates um, some kind of selective benefit. For example, in cholera or in pseudomonas, pseudomonas has this inversion that occurs around the flagellant genes, so that when it wants to colonize the mucosal surface, a phase variation occurs with a DNA inversion that actually shuts off the production of flagella, and that's how it can colonize surfaces. Um, so we found a phase variant for the Shalmanov strain, the translucent versus the creamy, where the translucent has low motility. So this phase variant, oops, when we basically created knockouts of the um, phages in this phase variant. So this phase variant has less motility, and the translucent actually makes more biofilms than the wild type of the cream. Okay, so it looks like this shellella underwent phase variation to make up for the prophages, so that they could form biofilms. And then when we get rid of the prophages, they actually knock out to make even more biofilms. So by getting rid of the, they either phase vary, they go under phase variation, or they, um, if we get rid of the prophages, not being a lysogen, but in, increase the production of biofilms because they have less motility. So the motility is affected by phase variation and the presence of these prophages. Okay? So with all this kind of stuff going on, you've got these bacteria that colonize, You've got bacteria becoming lysogens because they're being infected by viruses, and they're undergoing phase variation. So if you colonize an animal with a single bacteria, but it went from being a non-lysogen to a lysogen to a phase variant, 
by 16S, you would still see one bacteria. But you actually have three communities of bacteria living in the gut. And this is why cultural is such an important concept, is to understand how does the immune system of animals deal with all this variation that the variation in the microbiome is actually orders of magnitude higher than what we know by 16S. If the bacteria, the ecology of bacteria is so complicated. Right? So protochordates, of course, a simple model system it doesn't have adaptive immunity. So even a simple model system with just the innate immune system has to be able to deal with all this diversity of function in the microbiome. So protochordates, for example, don't have adaptive immunity, but they have this protein that we found, right? This PCP that we can work on. And the Ig domains we know bind the bacteria. And the chitin binding domains bind chitin because when we initially discovered them, we could purify these proteins, native proteins, using chitin columns. And we know that BCPs are oxonic, right? They oxonate bacteria, which means that when they bind bacteria, it increases phagocytosis. And we know now that um, the CBD is not required, the chitin binding domain is not required for those effects, right? And um, basically, the VCP staining that we did found VCP localized to the mucus, right? Oops. Here's VCP in, in, in red, and here's like a DAPI, decolorized DAPI stain that shows these little dots representing the microbes. But the VCP co localizes to that mucus, which is where the microbes will be colonizing, and we were asking, how does the VCP become tethered there? And to ask that question, we had to understand how the chitin binding domain functions. But we'll do that in a minute. We ask, when microbes colonize the surface of the, of the mucus, they're encountering VCPs. And this is the stuff that I contacted Bill Parker about a few years ago, was this idea that we found VCPs were actually shaping bowel film formation in a positive way with a lot of these native bacteria. They were binding these bacteria, influencing their settlement dynamics, and shaping bowel film formation. And it's very specific. If you use um, IgA in the same experiments with marine bacteria at the same concentration of new VCP, IgA does not influence biofilm formation in marine bacteria, but it influences biofilm formation in E. coli. For, and the same thing, VCPs on E. coli don't do anything. So there's some kind of specificity involved with marine bacteria that VCPs have co evolved. Here's an example untreated. These are VCP treated uh, biofilms of the pseudomonas strain. And when we use heat killed, all the different controls don't show any effect on bowel formation. This is just a simple crystal by the stain of resolubilized biofilms, right? So the effect of VCP now, we know from these phase variants, the effect of VCP is different among the different phase variants. Um, this is the now the phase variant of the uh, translucent strain that we found, where VCP impacts the formation of biofilms in one variant, and in the other variant, it has less of an effect. And then in the double knockout, it has almost no effect until later in the experiments, right, where it seems to delay some of the biofilm. And this is an effect of VCPs on these different phase variants. So the phase variants themselves are, the bacteria are changing their behavior and their function as a way potentially to deal with being bound with these immune proteins because the immune proteins are shaping their bowel formation. Um, and so this story becomes complex because you've got VCP binding to these different bacteria shaping their bowel films, but the bacteria undergoing phase variation. And it's this constant um, yin and yang. But what this set of experiments found was that the phase variants carrying the prophages were affected in a different way by the VCP. So under stationary condition, we know that VCPs can modulate biofilms. We think it involves directly prophage induction pathways. And, and, and I'll get to this in a minute because bacteria, the lysogens that are bound by VCPs, when we do TEM on the, on the supernatants, we see a bunch of phages in the supernatant that weren't there to begin with. So the VCPs are inducing the formation of and release of phages 
from these bacteria. And when that occurs, you get the release of eDNA. So not only do you get viral particles that are being released, but you get eDNA being shed from all the bacteria that are lysing. And these things become substrates for biofilm formation because eDNA, we know, is a great substrate for biofilm formation. And most biofilms, if you add DNAs, you can inhibit the formation of biofilms. So the DNA is a great scaffold for biofilm formation. And BCP is influencing motility, you see, as some of our latest data. That BCP binds these different phase variants, it affects their motility, and the motility itself can drive biofilm formation because the bacteria that move less can settle and form biofilms. So we know from stationary cultures that when you add BCP, the amount of DNA you can detect in the culture is high. This is how we know that eDNA is being released. eDNA here can be measured by total 1 and cytol 60, or staining for viral cells. And when we use lytic phages as a control, the lytic phages, if you titrate them, can give you the same kind of staining pattern as the biofilms that just have e, uh, that BCP added to them. So the BCP is shaping biofilm formation in part by a prophage induction pathway that leads to the production of viral particles, but also eDNA, and the eDNA itself becomes a scaffold for biofilms. And that's what these um, experiments show, that we follow the different behavior, the two different um, SF mu and SF pack, the two different prophages and showing up. If you if you follow their behavior over time, you can find the induction of the two different prophages at different time periods as the biofilms are forming when BCBs are present. And that they correlate with the abundance of biofilms that are growing in the culture. And if you take a super name from these cultures, this is actually um Brittany that even grass to it. These are phase particles that are coming directly from the supernatant of these induced fractions, and these induced fractions are generating virus the same way you would with a chemical agent like mitomycin C. Mitomycin C is a mutagen that is known to induce prophages, and that's your control. And then we add VCPs, and the VCP binding the lysogen is enough to induce these viruses. So the lysogens and the induced phages likely serve a critical role in shaping the microbiome, right? Because if the immune, if we think back that uh, the phages integrate into the genome in random positions, and that can affect their biosynthetic pathways, if the immune effector is binding and it activates these prophages, it could be affecting biosynthetic pathways in bacteria, but also the production of phage particles the release of eDNA that affects biofilm formation, and more. So, and here's an example. We have one confirmed case that we did from, from, from this prophage of pseudoalteromonas. When you induce pseudoalteromonas with BCP to, in, to make prophage, the phage particle that it makes is directly lytic against our shell model of 3313. Okay? And this is a virus that pseudoalteromonas makes. Pseudoalteromonas secretes this virus that can infect shell nail 3313 and lice it. Think about that for a minute. A host immune effector binds this bacteria, makes this virus, and kills this bacteria. And that's mediated by the host immune effector. There, there's huge implications. And we have this map of pathways that we're trying to work out. That all these are strains of bacteria that have come out of the Simona gut. And we, all the ones that have an asterisk are strains that we've sequenced now. We've sequenced them to, to sequence our full genome to have a better idea of how these um, prophages are integrated, how many prophages they have. And basically, what we think is happening is that these prophages are getting induced, and the viral particles are recognizing other bacteria as a new host for integration or to lyse them. It could be either or. Um, and all these pathways are pathways that we have preliminary evidence that these phages are actually integrating into other bacteria or lysing them. And we have actually 6731 just this past week, we confirmed can infect 6751 and integrate into the genome, not lyse it. So it actually integrated into the genome, and now 6751 becomes resistant to that, to that phage. So there's a dynamic in the gut of phage 
activation, bowel filtration, and phages that can infect other bacteria, all of which can be mediated by immune effectors, presumably. Right? So our hypothesis moving forward is that VCPC can shape the ecology of gut microbiomes by influencing bacterial settlement via prophage induction path pathways among life students, right? And this is also, of course, because the lysogenes, when they induce the prophages, they release eDNA, and you get all this eDNA forming and the formation of biofilms. So in the last part of the talk, yeah, there's only about five minutes left. The last part of the talk, we're going to talk about what the CBD does. And the CBD is another part of the VCP that we really wanted to understand. Is it just binding chitin on chitin columns to make it easier for us to isolate native proteins, or is it doing something else, right? So to, to find out and answer this question, we made a recombinant protein where we took the human IgG1 FC region and made a, a fusion with the CBD from Siona, and this became our probe to find out if Siona is making endogenous chitin. And basically, we find that the gut mucus is rich in chitin, just in, in the insect mid gut. And more and more and more, we're starting to recognize that a lot of animals, this has recently been shown on zebrafish as well, a lot of animals make chitin rich mucus for various reasons, right? I think aquatic animals need chitin to help the mucus tether to the, mucus, to the surface because Chris and Mia made morpholino knockdowns of chitin in zebrafish, and they got colitis. And all they all they would do was um, poop all their mucus out. The mucus would not adhere to the gut epithelium. So in aquatic animals, having chitin probably helps the, the mucus tether, but also the mucus, the chitin-rich mucus is most likely helping promote the stability and um, prevent infection by protozoans because protozoans often cannot penetrate chitin surfaces. Um, unless you're a protozoan that makes chitinases, and there are a few of those that do that. So they evolved that trait of secreting chitinases as a way to get through. But it's probably anti helminthic and anti protozoan to make these chitin rich surfaces. But the chitin itself is actually a huge carbon reservoir for bacteria. Because there's a lot of evidence that animals that secrete a chitin rich surface, their epithelium makes chitinases, and one can easily see how. The low level production of chitin mixes would create this digestion of chitin to create this diffusion of carbon rich molecules that would groom bacteria to colonize the surface. The bacteria love to eat chitin. So basically, what we find is that DCP is secreted into the mucus and it tethers to this chitin rich mucus. And that's how it stays attached to the mucus so that it can interact with, with bacteria. But then, in another series of investigations, which Susie just got published recently, um, we found that the CBD also recognizes chitin of fungi, okay, which is really important to think about because it has a lot of implications for bacterial fungal interactions, right? Um, the chitin binding domain of BCP appears to recognize uh, bud scars on spores, some some portions of hypofilaments, and very strongly on these sporangia things. These sporangia um, or organelles are basically these, these the sporangia are these bodies that fruiting bodies, I should call them, that fungal hyphae produce, where all the spores are. Made. And the spores are making the sporangia, and the BCPs seem to really concentrate on the spore forming region of the sporangia. Um, and then among yeast, we also get interactions. And there's some evidence that binding the uh, spores could delay um, the formation of, uh, of, of getting the, 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 height, the, the spores to germinate. And in an animal with fast transit, even if you delay germination by an hour or two, that could be functionally relevant, right? So, we're still trying to work that out, but there's some evidence that there could be a delay in the um, uh, spore, in the germination of spores. But among yeast, VCP has the opposite effect that you see in bacteria. Almost consistently, VCP reduces the formation of biofilms among yeast, and yeast like to form biofilms the way bacteria do. 
So we know that bacteria naturally colonize the mucosal surfaces together with fungi. All the green dots are fungi in this picture. So fungi are co-colonizing mucosal surfaces with bacteria. So imagine having an immune effector that can bind both bacteria and fungi in an environment like a gut that you want to bring things together to encourage their interaction out here to protect the host because when bacteria are in close proximity to fungi, that stimulates the fungi to make antibiotics. And, and the bacteria make antifungals. So the bacteria and fungi can basically control each other when they're, when they're together. So there's even evidence of bacteria colonizing fungal hyphae as a way to control hyphal spread. So anytime you can bring bacteria together with fungi, it's functionally relevant in ways that are important even clinically. So our hypothesis is that BCPs shape bacterial fungal interactions by influencing the proximity. And that BCPs influence the ratio of bacterial to fungal interactions on yeast biofilms so that binding bacteria and fungi can affect proximity and VCBPs could be tipping the scales between bacterial and fungal biofilms, probably because, in general, it's healthier to have bacterial biofilms than fungal biofilms, because fungi often are much more opportunistic than bacteria are already. So it's really interesting that this immune molecule would evolve to bind both. To our knowledge, this is the first immune molecule known that in a single protein you can bind bacteria and fungi together and bridge their proximity. So final thoughts. Um, using this invertebrate model system helps define how innate immunity right, works in modulating the gut microbiome. The idea that secreted immune effectors are shaping the ecology of microbiomes is a paradigm that we should all be thinking about. And uh, using these comparative model systems always encourages out-of-the-box thinking. So I, um, I, mean, I look forward to jumping to a new model system in the future, and maybe see like it approaches. Um, we think that there's likely really complex roles with temper changes that they're controlling the way lysogens behave. They're affecting their formation of biofilms, they're affecting their, their motility. And, so, and then being a lysogen itself really impacts how these bacteria live in the microbiome, right? And so, we're still trying to figure out how lysogens confer advantages, but there have to be major advantages that lysogens have because so many of these bacteria that colonize animals as part of their microbiome appear to be lysogens. So these kind of experiments also basically get us thinking about, about bacterial and fungal interactions, and fungi in general tend to be ignored in most studies, and fungi are always there, right? How would they cause an opportunistic infection if they weren't always there? And they're always there interacting with bacteria and with us. So we gotta start thinking about not just bacteria, but how fungi can interact with bacteria. And this interaction, I think, is right for drug discovery. I think the gut of animals is a microcosm for complex microbial interactions that could lead to the discovery of new drugs, especially coming from microbes from the ocean, you know, from filter feeders in the ocean that they bring these microbes into proximity, they generate these complex metabolic products, and there's probably a ton of drug discovery waiting to be happening with, with these with filter feeders. And that's it, my, this is the end of my talk. Uh, none of this work could be possible, of course, without a great team of people that I've had over the years, and I've got a new postdoc now, which is that uh, Susie was our legendary postdoc for a couple of years, and so much of the work that I presented here was really stuff that she trailblazed along with our previous grads in Brittany. Brittany was the one who discovered all the prophages and the effects of the prophages. And then Oges jumped right in now, and Oges is the one that's been working on all the phase variation and helping now with the new knockouts. So we have, and we have a fantastic history and uh, uh, grad students and undergrads and collaborators. And of course we've had the general support of two very nice grants from the NSF. And it's always nice to see the NSF um, recognize Sirona for these projects. Thank you. Sorry for going over. Thank you very much. Questions?